All right, welcome everyone. I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, which is co-presented by our terrific partners at the Leo Beck Institute and the Brooklyn Public Library. We're here to explore the life and legacy of Florence Mendheim, a courageous and little known librarian who spied on American Nazis in the 1930s at a historical moment in which Nazism was flourishing. Florence's story is fascinating in its own right, and it offers important lessons for our world today. Our hour-long program will begin with a panel discussion between Marshall Curry, an Academy Award-winning filmmaker who directed the short film A Night at the Garden, and Dr. Daniel Green, president and librarian at the Newberry Library in Chicago, adjunct professor of history at Northwestern University and curator of Americans and the Holocaust. The discussion will be moderated by Trevor Walsh, Collections Project Manager at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. The panel will be followed by an in-depth presentation of the Florence Mendheim Collection by Michael Simonson, Head of Public Outreach and Archivist at the Leo Beck Institute. Michael's presentation will be followed by another brief discussion and by an audience Q&A period, and we'll wrap up on the hour. Please feel free to share questions and comments in the Zoom chat throughout the program, and we'll get to as many as we can towards the end. Thank you all for joining us today. And without further ado, I'll hand things off to Treva. Thanks so much for that, Ari. Um, I'm so excited to get to talk about this, I think, very timely topic. Um, so Danny, can you get us started by describing the political and economic climate in the United States in the 1930s? Um, what was going on around the time that Florence Mendheim began her investigative work? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Treva, also for having me. And thanks to, to Ari and the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Uh, it, it's Great Depression America during the 1930s. We, we are in the depth of um, economic crisis. Um, by the time that the Nazis come to power in, in 1933, we've been, um, oh, we've been suffering through a depression for, for more than three years that will um, go on in fits and starts. There's some recovery in the mid thirties, but a, another downturn in the late thirties. So we have almost a, a decade of economic depression it's an isolationist nation um, during during the 1930s. World War One is only about 15 years in the in the rearview mirror for Americans, and most Americans um, think that our entry into World War One had had been a mistake. We 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 pull back from international affairs, um, and then we need to talk about white supremacy in the United States in in the 1930s. It's a segregated America. Um, it's it's Jim Crow America with with segregated public facilities and, and private and, and often um, that um, segregation is enforced through violence um, and even um, even lynchings um, of African Americans. And then it's a xenophobic and anti-Semitic America as well. I think if, as, you, as you look back to the 20th century, it's fair to say that the 1930s are arguably the height of anti-Semitism in America during the 20th century and, and they're on the rise. Um, and so we see um, we see a society that has a deep fear of foreigners um, and is trying to draw boundaries, tight boundaries over who's in and who's out when it comes to um, belonging in America. And I think on that note, can you tell us about the German American Bund, one of the Nazi organizations that kind of at the center of the story? Yeah, so the Bund is founded in 1936, but it's the successor organization to an organization known as the Friends of New Germany. Um, the, the leader of the Bund um, is a man named Fritz Kuhn, who we're going to hear more about today from, from my co-panelists, I think. He, he fashions himself as the American Fuhrer. Um, he, he, he dreams of a, of a fascist America. Um, I, I think it's fair to say he dreams of more support also from the, the Nazi German regime that he, that he doesn't get here in the United States, but he emulates um, some of the practices um, that we see in, in Nazi Germany, especially trying to reach youth. Um, there are, some, there are uh, German American Bund summer camps across the country where we see um, the, um, the practices that, that we're used to seeing in Nazi Germany, whether that's carrying swastika flags, um, you know, calisthenics and those kind of exercises that look very much like a preparation for um, militaristic um, engagement. Um, and I think a key point um, to understand about the Bund is 
they consider themselves American patriots and they see Nazism and Americanism as compatible, uh, not as even as they're dreaming of a fascist America, they think of themselves as patriotic Americans. So to turn to you, Marshall, your film, A Night at the Garden, provides a powerful window into the German American boon. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. So I uh, am not a historian, um, and and so I'm. I think I'm probably like a lot of Americans who were totally ignorant of this chapter of our history. Um, I was at a, a dinner with a friend who was writing a screenplay that takes place in New York in 1939, and he told me that there had been a rally that filled Madison Square Garden in 1939, where 20,000 Americans gathered to celebrate the rise of Nazism, and there's, you know, a 30 foot portrait of George Washington adorned with swastikas and people are waving the American flag and saying the Pledge of Allegiance, but it's all intertwined with, with anti-Semitism, um, anti-immigrant um, uh, fascist uh, ideology. And I frankly didn't believe him until I got home that night and Googled it. And sure enough, it, it, it had happened. And not only that, there were some small clips from Historic, historical documentaries had some little clips from, from the night. Um, and I thought, well, wow, if, if, if a little bit of this thing was filmed, probably a lot of it was filmed somewhere. And so I uh, got an archival researcher and he started poking around and, and we ended up coming up with a lot of footage that uh, was, some of it was in the National Archive, some of it was in UCLA's archive, Grinberg archive. and and. Um, and I had never seen any of it. Um, and uh, so I decided to try to, to put it together into a film, created a short seven minute film with no narration, no interviews, just uh, drops a, a modern day audience member into that event and, and hopefully um, gives them a point of view about American history and about sort of the fallibility of, of the human species and, and Americans in particular. So let's watch a short clip from that film. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Americans, American patriots, I'm sure I do not come before you tonight as a complete stranger. You all have heard of me through the Jewish controlled press as a creature with horns, a cloven hoof, and a long tail. We, with American ideals, demand that our government shall be returned to the American people who founded it. If you ask what we are actively fighting for under our charter, first, a social, just, white, Gentile ruled United States. Second, Gentile controlled labor union, free from Jewish Moscow directed domination. Okay, so what you just saw was a clip um, from Marshall's film, and you saw Fritz, we saw Fritz Julius Kuhn's remarks, and then a man named Isidore Greenbaum rushes the stage. Um, Marshall, can you explain a little bit about what's going on there, and then maybe tell us why in 2017 you decided to produce a film about this historical moment? Sure, so um, the 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 rally, as you're seeing, um, uh, has 
lots of patriotic images and and a speech that you know tells the audience that they need to stick up for their American ideals and take it take the country back from from the people who are who are threatening America. Um, and then a, a protester named Isidore Greenbaum runs out on stage. He's a Jewish plumber's assistant from Brooklyn who actually went to the rally that night to see what was going on, didn't have a plan to run out on stage, but um, was so appalled by what he saw happening on stage that he just kind of couldn't control himself and, and ran out. Uh, you see him uh, grabbed at that point, the, the, the footage continues where he gets beaten up and eventually they rip his pants off and throw him, out, uh, throw him off stage um, to the delight of the audience who cheers and laughs. And, um, and uh, I guess when I saw that, the, the raw footage, it felt very familiar to me, unfortunately familiar. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I wanted uh, to, to, to remind people about this chapter of American history when we had leaders who scapegoated immigrants and minority religions and attacked the press and used sneering humor and, you know, mob think to, to, to get audiences to turn against each other. And, um, and, and used kind of classic demagogue uh, tactics of wrapping their ideology and the symbols of, of patriotism to try to, to try to sell hate and division. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I thought that it's one thing for Americans to see that happening in Germany or to see it happening in, another, in other countries. But when you see it happen in America, in Madison Square Garden, and you think about the people who are in that audience, it's 20,000 New Yorkers. I'm a New Yorker. These are people who would be my neighbors and probably I would like them and they would have dropped their kids off at, at, you know, at the babysitter that evening and they put on their hats and their dresses and their suits and they, and they went out to, to an entertaining rally that night. All of that um, was, uh, was, was frightening to me and, and, and I hoped that by reminding people about it, it could be kind of a cautionary tale about, about us slipping into those sorts of things again. It certainly feels all too familiar for us right now. But so this brings us to the story of Florence Mentheim, um, who, who began her undercover surveillance of Nazi groups in 1933 and then concluded it in 1939, right around the time of the rally in Madison Square Garden. So now let's turn to Michael Simonson, the head of public outreach and archivist at the Leo Beck Institute to teach us about men time. Thank you. Um, I'll begin by sharing my screen. I'll start my little program here. Let's see. Florence Menheim, yes. Um, so uh, Florence Menheim uh, worked uh, largely um, secretly for the American Jewish Congress in New York, gathering information about the Nazi movement in the United States. And uh, to begin to, um, to talk about that, I'll first begin by saying a little bit about her, um, her early life. So she was born in Chicago in 1899, but largely raised in New York. Um, she attended Washington Irving High School near Gramercy Park, and the family ended up living up in the Bronx. They were German Jews, and um, the family had, had a successful business in Berlin, and members of the family still had it. And the children grew up with a very uh, definite German Jewish identity. They um, spoke German at home still and they were connected to it culturally. They were also connected to their Judaism culturally. They um, kept kosher at home. They um, attended services. Uh, later in life, Florence Menheim actually was interested and did in fact become um, work in adult education um, on Jewish history and culture. So she, um, in 1918, started a library career. Now, she, to say she's a librarian is actually not quite correct because she never did attend library school. She worked as a clerk um, since high school in the New York Public Library. And she was sent kind of wherever she was, was needed where there were vacancies. So she worked basically at three branches um, between 1918 
1938, but she was actually sent to even more. These included the Adendorfer branch, which was a German, basically a German library in the East Village, German language library, because there was still a large number of German immigrants in the neighborhood. And then up in Yorkville at a branch that today is called the Bloomingdale branch, um, which it's actually in Harlem, but it's just north of Yorkville, which is on the Upper East Side and was predominantly a German neighborhood at the time. And it was the headquarters for the, um, in many ways, for the Nazi movement um, in the New York, New Jersey region. So um, she worked as a librarian at a number of these branches. This is a, a picture of her um, from the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And uh, I wanted to say too, before I continue that she actually was um, rather athletic. And I found information that she joined the Librarian Athletic Club. She was a, she was, um, on a, uh, she was a good racer, relay racer. <laughs> The funny fact that maybe says something about her personality. Um, we move now to a, a Rabbi Stephen Weiss, who um, uh, Florence um, became involved in his synagogue, uh, the Free Synagogue in Manhattan. Uh, when the Nazis took power in 1933, one of their first acts in Germany was a boycott of Jewish businesses. And Rabbi Stephen Weiss responded by saying we have to boycott German goods in retaliation for what they are doing to Jewish businesses and to Jews in general in Germany. And uh, then actually he went on and um, wasn't really founder. That was, that, that, that's not quite correct, but he um, kind of reorganized the American Jewish Congress um, and into a, an organization that became dedicated to um, fight Nazism. So who were, were they spying on? Is a good question. They were spying on um, a group that was known as the Friends of the New Germany. And this was the precursor to the German American Bund. It was started in 1924 in Chicago where it was called Free Society of Teutonia and a large um, movement developed based in Chicago, New York, and New Jersey for the most part. It was officially renamed Friends of the New Germany in July 1933. This was actually partly on orders of uh, Rudolf Hess, the Nazi leader in Germany itself. And the organization was helped in its formation, interestingly enough, by the German consulate here in New York, which of course had a abundance of Nazi numbers, as otherwise you probably were not going to be assigned to any consulate German post. Uh, they, they, they wore uniforms, both men and women. The pin you see in this picture is the pin for Friends of the New Germany. And Florence Menheim, when she went undercover to meetings, she had a pin, which she would quickly, this pin, which she would um, quickly put on her clothes. Uh, to attend the meetings and pass as a Nazi. Uh, there were between 5,000 and 10,000 members, but this doesn't count for all the extra people who attended the rallies, um, believed in the Nazi movement in the United States, or also just took part in its activities. I think it's important that uh, many German um, immigrants or descendants of German immigrants saw this as kind of a continuation of a of a, a German cultural activity of, of the Rhine, of joining organizations that had, you know, concerts and they went bowling and they had picnics and they had discussions. And they, in some ways, were probably a little, um, as crazy as it sounds to us today, divorced from it politically in some ways, but thought of it as a kind of a social activities club of sorts with a political bent. Um, Florence Menheim began her undercover work in 1933. And at the Leo Beck Institute, where we have her collection, we have some of her notes, which she would write up um, to deliver to the um, American Jewish Congress. And um, she was hopeful always 
that these notes would go past that and um, reach the FBI. She she often said, you know, these I want these notes to I want the federal government to do something to know this is going on. We don't know how much her notes and information were shared with higher authorities. I'll talk about that in a little bit. These are notes from a meeting she attended of the Friends of the New Germany in May 1933. And this was in the Yorkville neighborhood on the Upper East Side on 86th Street. And um, among her notes here, uh, you see she has a red circle around the name of a Nazi leader she was listening to, uh, who she talks to afterwards. And she gets his name because uh, that, that's important because they're all using aliases. And in this case, she has managed to get him to tell her his real name. This, this largely was accomplished at times by flirting with these Nazis, which she's actually very repelled by having to do this aspect of the job. Um, and she listens to this speech by this man, Vildegans, about how, um, in this case, about how the Russian Revolution was caused by the Jews. As a result, the Jews now live in luxury, while all the, Russia, all the other Russian Gentiles, Russian Christians live in extreme poverty. Later on in these notes, she talks about how she takes a bus ride home with a woman who um, acts very psychotic and paranoid. And I presume that she's talking a lot about the Jews on this bus ride home. And Florence says she hopes that she gets, gets hit by an oncoming bus. <laughs> uh, she also mentions, Florence Menheim does that the book, The International Jew by Henry Ford, is one of the books being sold at this meeting. Uh, this is kind of interesting because there is a relationship to Henry Ford because the, the, the um, leader of the Friends of the New Germany, the man who led the movement before Fritz Kuhn, later on, who we saw speak in the movie, he had worked for Henry Ford actually, and um, had moved from there into running this organization. Of course, Henry Ford, the famous American a manufacturer, an anti-Semite. Uh, it's very funny, I'll just, uh, before we leave this slide to say that Florence is not scared of making scathing personal observations about people, which, which makes her, you know, her notes kind of humorous to read at times. She, she's very repelled by the whole movement, but she, of course, but she, um, she's also very good at, 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 at being a spy in a way. She has um, uh, fake code names. She has, um, when she writes to the rabbi, um, at the Free Synagogue, Rabbi Cohen. She uses the code KQX as her signature. She also uses in these meetings, she introduces herself as Gertrude Mueller. And also she has a third alias as Anna Hitler because they were, she was interested or else uh, the people who were, um, she was working for were interested in finding actual relatives of Adolf Hitler in the United States and making contact with them. So she's going by these three aliases. Uh, that meeting that she was describing there was held at the Casino Theater on 86th Street in Yorkville, Manhattan. Uh, it's always interesting to go through the notes and see where these meetings were held. Because of course, these are, if you here in New York, they're, they're, they were very common locations. This was also a Nazi hangout. It was in Bushwick. Brooklyn slash Ridgewood, Queens, right at the border on Knickerbocker and Myrtle Avenue, for those who know that part of Brooklyn. It was called the Swabian Hall. The restaurant part of it was called the Black Forest Inn. And this was a, a big place for um, Nazis in Brooklyn and Queens to gather. The main, uh, the main support of the Nazi movement in Brooklyn was actually in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, is my understanding. But they were interested in getting more followers in this area of Brooklyn and Queens because it was, um, because there was a left-leaning political uh, movements among the German community as well. And they were kind of stationed in this neighborhood. So, um, Florence talks about at this one meeting she goes to here that they actually had more politically left people uh, give a few talks as well. 
and then the Nazis respond to them, and it was an attempt to have a kind a, a kind of debate. Anyway, um, at this, there's notes about this one meeting she attended here at the end of towards in the late summer of 1933, where she actually ends up being invited to go out for coffee with um, some of the leading Nazis at the meeting after afterwards. And so she's pretty scared. It's clear in the notes, have they figured out that she's a spy or are they gonna try and make a pass at her? But then some women are also going, so maybe it'll be safe enough. She feels she has to go or it will look suspicious. So she goes with them and they drive back into the city. They go to Cafe Hindenburg on 86th Street again in Yorkville. That's the main uh, Nazi main street in New York, it seems. And um, it's, she finds out that Cafe Hindenburg is in fact a late night Nazi hangout. And in fact, um, other Nazis come in, they have a big table in the back, they talk about their politics, they talk about how much they hate the Jews, they um, greet each other, in fact, um, with the saying, Stirp deine Jude, which is to um, kill a Jew or a Jew dies. Um, unbelievably enough, that's their handshake and how they greet each other, almost like a password to say they're both, that they're part of this movement. She stays there till very late. She um, then, they want to take her home. Well, she's given in, in her membership card, because she's, she's joined the Friends of the New Germany, um, albeit as a spy, but as part of her cover, she has an address um, in Yorkville. But in truth, she lives with her brothers in the Bronx still. And they're, of course, homesick with worry about her. So she um, tells them the address and they drive her there and she gets out of the car. She goes into the building, waits in the lobby, pretends to check her mail. And then she looks and sees when the car is gone. And then she bolts for the subway and she gets to the subway and races downstairs and gets home safely. So this is also a good example of the type of, of scary things that she was having to go through um, as part of a spy and the constant danger of being discovered. She's also kosher. So when she goes, for example, to Cafe Hindenburg, she's trying to obey the, the kashrut laws as well, but she can't let them notice she's doing that. So, so everything is very fraught. Eventually, um, Florence ends up working for Friends of the New Germany. And it's unclear why she stops her espionage work. I read in one place that she had been discovered and, um, and then she was pulled out of that work, but I only found that in one place. So I'm simply unclear after a while why she was no longer part of it, but she did work as an employee of the Friends of the New Germany for a while. And her um, in, in the offices in Yorkville. One thing that she does at these meetings, besides collecting names, um, what the discussions are about, who's who, is she collects material. They're always selling material. And in fact, this material is largely coming in, the Nazi material, through German sailors who bring it with them. Um, into New York, where it's then dissemin disseminated. And um, actually, as part of that issue, uh, there was a congressman named Samuel Dickstein, and he started um, a special committee on un-American activities authorized to investigate national socialist propaganda. And um, it was a result of a bunch of hearings related to this influx of Nazi propaganda material that uh, the organization eventually was reformed as the German American Bund so that it would seem to be more American. Talk more about that. It was um, dissolved and renamed in, in 1936. So she collected a lot of material at these meetings and most of our collection is actually the, the, this material. Um, so here is an advertisement to a Nazi rally at New York's Turn Hall on 85th and Lexington. And uh, as you see here, they had no problems um, uh, with the idea of hiding their anti-Semitic nature that was all out in the open. This is, um, 
an advertisement for a, an evening sponsored by the German American Bund. It's a military concert ball or festival. If you see on the lower right, they're still using the pin of Friends of the New Germany. Uh, this is another event, True Pictures of Conditions in Germany. So this was just a presentation of how great things were in Germany now that Hitler had taken power and he had saved their country from depression where America still needed help. This was the propaganda of that. One thing interesting in the collection too is a, is a lot of the pamphlets and the material, of course they have advertisements in them, pages and pages. And that's very interesting because it's just like a, a guide to who supported the Nazi cause in German New York and New Jersey. You know, they, they proudly advertise their own businesses um, on the pages of this extremely anti-Semitic uh, pro-Nazi publications. This is an example of one of those pages. There are other um, papers and so on that are also sold um, at these meetings. Uh, so besides the Nazi stuff that's being brought in from Germany, there's more than enough um, anti-Semitic American uh, publications as well. This is from the National American, as you see, Jews defile our Christmas. You know, it, 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 the, the anti-Semitism, I would say, um, it is not very different between what the Americans are publishing and what the Germans are publishing. Does it ever change? There's a lot of talk about a lot of conspiracy theory, a lot of the protocols of the elders of Zion constantly being discussed. Uh, when the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped, there's a lot of articles about the idea of the blood libel, the Jews steal the child for their own satanic rituals and etc. Here's another example of something she picked up. Are we gonna choose, is America gonna choose the Aryan nationalism of God or, or Jewish Marxism? I think this, this uh, image kind of explains pretty much all, sadly, all the uh, publications pretty directly. So I'll end here so we can continue on uh, with the discussion. I wanted to say that after her work um, as a spy, Florence Menheim became involved in the Committee for Arab Jewish Understanding. A lot, a lot of her work was also personally motivated, as we said, she had um, family members still in Germany, uh, people trying to get out. Many of them did not get out and were murdered in the Holocaust. Um, eventually after the war, she continued to work at the library a while. And then she uh, went into adult Jewish education. Uh, later on in her life, uh, she never married and she lived with her brother always. Later on in her life, she would sometimes talk about being a spy and these adventures, let's call them, um, that she had had. Uh, a lot of times people didn't believe her. She thought, oh, oh, they thought a little kind of, this, uh, you know, this kind of uh, eccentric, unmarried librarian has these kind of fantasies of being a spy against the Nazis. And they didn't really believe it. And it was only um, after her passing, when this um, material was donated, that uh, people realized, oh, she really had these experiences and she really did have this amazing story. So it's sad that this only became more um, known as a story after her lifetime. So she's not here to talk, wasn't here to talk more about it herself or else leave memories of it to us. So I thank you and we can go back to the main discussion here. Hold on. There. Can you thank see you so much? Yeah, thank you so much for that, Michael. I, I think I speak for everyone when I say we all really appreciate you sharing that information and, and Florence's story with us. Um, so to turn to Danny and Marshall, what are your initial reactions to Michael's presentation? Well, I, Marshall, I guess I'll start if you don't mind. Um, you know, as a historian, 
um, some of the it's some of the unknowns that are so interesting to me that you know Michael has alluded to um, a lot of a lot of this you know why why did Florence Menheim um, feel it was worth taking the risk um, to do what she was doing what motivated her so as a historian you know who's based in evidence of course I wish we had more evidence about her own work in her own words um, certainly we have those reports which are um, fascinating, but to think about people who go against the grain like this and who um, decide to take such significant risks, I, I always want to hear more from that. You know, hear more from them about about why they did it, um, and so that that's a that's a frustration um, around around this story for me is um, is all the unknowns, um, and then of course there's admiration of her work. Um, there are a lot of ways to fight a Nazi enemy. Um, and this was an important way to, for, for that Florence Menheim considered um, to, to fight a Nazi enemy. And, and I, I think um, that she would probably agree with the idea that it's up to individuals um, to stand up for what they believe in in some way that matters to them and that it's up to individual citizens um, to to protect what they value, in this case, democracy. Yeah, I, I will say as a as a, a storyteller, as a filmmaker, that's that's the thing that I love about it is that idea of an individual who says, yes, there are huge political systems, yes, there are you know giant problems, but what's what's something that I can do? Um, and uh, you, it, you know, it makes me think about Isidore Greenbaum running out on stage and taking just making a, a stand against 20,000 people saying this is not okay this is not okay and um you know was, I, when the film came out uh, i heard from isidore greenbaum's grandchildren who got in touch and um and they shared you know some some things that uh that they knew about him and uh, he he was uh quoted in the press very late in his life um where somebody asked him, uh, you know, why did you do what you did in spite of in spite of the risk? And he said, gee, what would you have done if you were in my place? And I love that question because it's a challenge to, to everybody who watches it. Like, would I have done that? What am I doing right now in the face of, of demagoguery and anti-immigrant, uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim attitudes? What, what are we doing? So I, I think those stories that, that kind of question what we as individuals can do um, are, are, are really important to tell. I, I certainly am also struck by Florence's courage and something that is really amazing about her story is that, um, you know, it, it's more unexpected than something as direct as rushing the stage um, and yet we would not know about everything that happened in the way that we do if she had not done this documentative work. Um, so, and I think maybe, you know, you can all speak to this as archivists, historians, filmmakers, what motivated people like her and Isidore to step up even at great personal risk? And, and you've all, all kind of, um, address this to some degree, but to ask it directly. I mean, I, I, I can start, but though I have a very in, inconclusive response to that, I think for her, it, was, it, it largely was her own family, rel her relatives in Germany. She knew they were in danger. She knew Nazism was a threat. In the collection, there's letters to the family in Germany. What's going on? Are you applying for visas? There's attempts at paperwork and creating it. And she's also very concerned in the collection about, about her using her code names. So who she really is doesn't get back to the Nazis in Germany. Because if they find out, they could take it out on her, on her family. Sadly, many of them didn't get out. And so the results for her own family were tragic anyway. But I, that's one reason beyond that though, it's hard to know, right? What creates an, uh, a, kind of, a kind of courageous, altruistic personality. So I'll just leave it at that. Maybe the others have more. 
I would just add, Michael, too, I, I agree with what you're saying. There's also, there, there is circulating in the United States during the 1930s, a lot of fear around spies, um, whether it's Nazi spies here in the United States, or I mean, it, it were, or um, people trying to infiltrate um, Nazi groups. We see, we, we know um, actually much more about the infiltration of um, another stronghold of Nazism, which was out in Los Angeles um, from a book um, by Stephen Ross called it called Hitler in Los Angeles about how there were um, it, it was known that people were doing this and it was feared that people were um, by by the Nazi organizations themselves. So I think that that makes Florence's work Florence Bentheim's work even more um, dangerous and courageous. And and I I would point out I, I think it's not um, it's not unimportant that she's a librarian. Um, that um, access to information, right? Archivists, librarians, historians are concerned about preservation and access to information. And so that is, um, that's happening in, um, for Florence in her non-secret life and it's part of her, her spying work that, that it seems to be a value in her life of, um, of shining a light on information that should be shared. I would say for Isidore Greenbaum, my understanding is that it was less strategic and more just sort of a visceral snap decision that he made that moment. Um, and if you watch the, the, the footage, people can watch the, the whole seven minute film at a night at the garden.com. It's just up there for free. Um, but if you watch it, it will give you that nod in the stomach. You, you'll, you'll understand what would make someone say this, this can't go without without someone addressing it. Um, that night he was arrested uh, for disturbing the peace um, after he was thrown off stage and he had to pay uh, a fine the next day. And, and the New York Times had has the articles about, um, about the rally that night and then about his hearing the next day, which as a little parenthetical, you know, the, the New York Times, if you're a subscriber, you can search for, for digitized foot, uh, stories, all of their stories from the entire history on their thing that's called the, the Times Machine. So it's really a great resource to be able to put in any date or any event and look at the actual physical newspaper of what they were reporting and how it was being reported. But, but the, the day after there was a, a small article that said, you know, protester um, pays fine. And apparently the, the magistrate said to him, don't you realize that someone could have been hurt from what you did on stage uh, from disrupting it like that? And, and he said, well, don't you realize someone's gonna be hurt from the things that were being set up on that stage? And of course, this is 1939 and we know what would happen over the next few years. Okay, we are getting some really, really excellent questions in the chat and the Q and A. So I wanna ask a few of those. Um, so a lot of people have been asking for more information about the role of Stephen Weiss and the American Jewish Committee. Um, so how organized was the kind of anti-Nazi um, intelligence efforts and were their efforts actually accepted by the FBI? Is anyone, I, I can try and answer that with the limited knowledge I have about it. I do know, I, I have talked to someone actually in the archives in, um, in um, Cincinnati at the um, seminary there. And I know that they have a lot of papers of the American Jewish Congress. And there, it doesn't sound like, like it was so officially organized, but it's clear there was a network that was operating in some manner. And I didn't, I didn't have time to look too much more into it. I think part of it is because it's just not something that's been discussed very much. So it's very hard to find information about it. I do think that Florence Menheim, some of the material she gathered was probably used um, later in these hearings by um, Congressman uh, Dick Stein when he, had, when he established the Special Committee for Un-American Activities that was related to Nazi propaganda, which brought about the reconstruction of the movement to becoming the German American Bund. Because um, this, 
that that, time, that would be the right time frame. As far as if the FBI or who else saw it at the federal level, that, that, that remains a mystery. Sure, certainly though, the American Jewish Congress, um, I, it'd be very hard to believe they weren't sharing this information or at least trying to share it if the parties were interested. A lot of it also is about the, about American anti-Semitism historically at the federal level, which of course was very, very prominent, sadly. Again, others might be able to answer more than me about that. I would just add that it's not only the American Jewish Congress and, and Rabbi Wise, the, um, the Anti-Defamation League is interested in um, the kind of material that, that spies are, are gathering as well. So it's, um, I, I've seen a lot of questions in the chat already of you know, what, what more can we read about Florence Menheim? There, 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 there's no book about Florence Menheim and even a lot of books that deal with um, spying um, on Nazi organizations or not, or the history of these Nazi organizations themselves don't mention her. Uh, so there is, um, there, there's a lot more digging for historians and others to do to learn more about this um, fascinating figure, but, but we would have to, we'd have to piece it together from many, many different, different places um, in, I think, Michael, it's fair to say, small drips and drops there, throughout sadly. the archives. Yeah. Sadly so, absolutely. And any and even for main for any larger book about the subject in general, except for the one you mentioned about Los Angeles, there's very little, very little. They spied, the war ended. It, it was kind of forgotten, I would say, by the American public at that point. And in all points, right? In the fact there had been in such organizations. Of course, America wanted to forget they had that had been happening in the first place. And then also the fact that there were spies and people fighting it was also forgotten. And I, I did see a question in the chat about kind of the provenance of the collection at LBI. So how did it actually come about that this material is at um, the center? Right, so it actually, um, it, after she died, it was discovered by her brother and I and they decided to do an exhibit down at Museum of Jewish Heritage, I think. And so they brought it down there and I think they did do some small exhibit back in the, I don't know. There was an exhibition at um, the Stephen Wise Synagogue actually. And then oh, after oh, okay. that, okay, sorry. it was transferred I'm to the museum. Confused. Sure, so then from there, they were going, then from there, they weren't going to keep the, the material in their archives. So they brought it then to the Leo Beck. And that's how we ended up with it. Quite a while after that exhibit though, I think they kept it a while and then they gave it to us. That's what happened. And I think we kind of alluded to this, but um, did, did the leaders of Nazi Germany support the German American Bund? And what about American political leaders at this time? I'll maybe let others answer that. Well, I, yeah, I, I go ahead, Marshall. You I, I was just going to say, yeah, my understanding is that, that they did not really support the Bund. Um, I, I, they shared the ideology, but but um, I believe that they um, kind of didn't want to to stir up the American interest in this um, because they were busy trying to take over Europe, and they wanted to be able to do that without uh, swatting the hornet's nest of America. But Danny. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I think um, I think it's fair to say that Fritz Kuhn, who was the head of the Bund, and that's who you saw speaking um, in in Marshall's film, uh, wanted more support from directly from Nazi Germany um, than than he got. And he he travels to Germany in the summer of of 1936. I believe it's during the during the Olympic Games that Fritz Kuhn go, goes over there and wants an audience with Hitler and wants time with Hitler and doesn't, and, and, and is not satisfied. Um, doesn't, does, never, never gets that attention that, um, that, that he wants. It's not, it's not that the Nazi leaders are unaware of what's going on in the United States. They're, they're very aware of what's going on in the United States. They wanna, um, especially the propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels wants to sow discord in the United States and talk about how um, the persecution of Jews in, in Europe resembles um, segregation in, you know, throughout, throughout America and the treatment of, of African Americans. So when, when, when pointing to the United States works for Nazi German propaganda, they'll, they'll make it work. But 
um, and, and, and they'll call on it. But the, the German American Bund is never as central um, in the sites as the members of the German American Bund want it to be in looking over to Germany. I, I guess the second part of the question was, was how did American politicians or the American public in general feel about the Bund? And my sense is that there wasn't a lot of support for the Bund. You know, when you, again, when you read the New York Times the day after the rally, Mayor LaGuardia is calling the, the event at Madison Square Garden, you know, the largest gathering of international cooties under one, under one roof ever held. And um, there was a lot of, of, um, of dislike of the Bund, but, um, but anti-Semitism was, was a very mainstream, uh, was a very mainstream point of view. And, you know, we mentioned Henry Ford, William Randolph Hearst, Charles Lindbergh, Father Coughlin, like, and there were many people who either supported the idea of, of, of anti-Semitism. And beyond that, the, the, the question of anti-Semitism was just considered a legitimate point of view to be debated. You know, the question of whether the Jewish nature was somehow anti-American, that was a legitimate debate. And, and one of the things that I find so interesting about the, the transition from that period to today is how did that become, a, how did that get moved out of the place of legitimate debate into, into the world of crazies? Because that, and the answer to that question, I think uh, is, is really important as we talk today about how to engage with hate speech and, and you know, when, when it should be shut down and deplatformed and when it should be debated. Um, you know, these are questions that are happening on college campuses and they're happening in, in Twitter sphere and they're happening in, 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 in the, you know, all over the world. And um, so, I don't know, I, I find that a really interesting historical question that, that really speaks so, so deep, you know, in such a precise way to, to debates we're having now. Right, I think Marshall's right. There's a, there's a really a wide range of thinking about American anti-Semitism at the time, and the Bund is is at one far end of of the spectrum. You know, you, you might find a lot of Americans in the 1930s who say, "I don't want Jewish people moving into my neighborhood," or "I wouldn't want to be a roommate in college with a Jewish person," or something like that. But with with the Bund, you're talking about um, you're talking about American Nazis, right, and Nazi sympathizers in the United States. You don't have to be a Nazi sympathizer to be anti-Semitic, of course. And I, you know, you see someone like Greenbaum who has the courage. I mean, it, it's a great scene in Marshall's fantastic film to see that that moment. Um, there are others too. Um, Dorothy Thompson, a, a, a very well-known American journalist, is heckling in the crowd. And then, by some newspaper estimates. There's 100,000 protesters outside on the street. Now, whether that, you know, estimating crowds is tough, whether there really were 100,000 protesters, but the, 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 the sense from most newspaper accounts is there are more protesters out on the street uh, uh, um, against this rally than there are people in Madison Square Garden supporting this rally. And that's, I, I think it's an important thing to, to say to, to, um, um, to talk about opposition to support for Nazism in the United States at the time. And then, so um, what happened to the German American Bund when it disbanded? And, and I guess I'd also ask, why did it disband? And I wanna ask together with that question, uh, because I think the answers may be somewhat related. Um, why was Florence Mentheim and her investigative work kind of forgotten after this period? I can just say really quickly the 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 what you see at the night uh, a night at the garden February twentieth nineteen thirty nine is arguably the high point for for the Bund. Um, later that year, Fritz Kuhn, um, the the head of the Bund, um, is um, investigated for tax evasion and um, other financial improprieties. I think both within the Bund and outside of the Bund, and he is um, indicted, and um, that helps pull the Bund apart. There's not, he doesn't have as strong a successor. And then of course, after Pearl Harbor, um, we go to war against Nazi Germany. And um, it's much more difficult at that point for vocal public support of Nazism once we're at war. And ultimately Fritz Kuhn has a citizenship stripped from him and, and, and is deported to West Germany. So 
um, which is pretty remarkable um, turn of events. Yeah, I would say I would just say to add to that. I think it then I. As I was saying earlier, I think with the end of the uh, with the, with the war and what happened, there was, uh, you know, America also had to um, kind of uh, I don't want to say reinvent this history because as it's been pointed out, it was always a minority group, but um, but they but it wasn't something people wanted to talk about. Certainly, those families or people who'd been members after the war didn't want to talk about it. And I think Americans also felt it was in, in their best interest not to talk about it. And as a result, these spies, that story was also lost because uh, to have spies also implies there was a need, there were Nazis, right? So if you're good, forgetting about the Nazis, you're gonna, you have to forget about the spies too. It's a very, kind of a pretty vulgar basic understanding of it. But I think there's a lot of truth in that actually still. And before my last question, I just want to echo a comment that I've seen in the chat a couple of times, which is that it is, it is very strange. Um, there, are, there are two organizations often called the Bund and uh, we are talking about the German American Bund, the Nazi organization, not the y Yiddish labor organization. Um, so with that, I just want to ask to kind of sum up, do you think that we as Americans have done enough to reckon with this history? Well, I, I certainly think there's always more to learn about this history, right? And Florence Mendheim is, is a great example of that. You, as we've been saying, you could read uh, multiple books about American anti-Nazi activism. You could read multiple books about support for Nazism through the German American Bund and yet still not see Florence Mendheim, right? And I think that's what's so exciting about um, digging into her material. It points to the fact that there is still so much to find in archives or in attics um, around around the country today, um, and so um, I think there should be a continual uh, a, a continual reckoning with this. I think, um, although Mendheim doesn't give us this in her own words, um, she's vigilant against external against internal enemies, and I think we um, certainly have reckoning to do with remaining vigilant. I'll just say as a, as a non-expert, uh, somebody who didn't um, you know, have spent my career studying this period, I think that there is a lot more reckoning to do, that there are a lot of people who know nothing about this part of American history. And, and from hearing the responses to, to the film, um, there are lots and lots and lots of people who have no idea that this could ever have possibly been a part of America's history. And I feel like it's worth sharing, not to be critical of America, but as a, as a cautionary tale to say, hey, even we are fallible and, and, and we need to uh, defend democracy, defend you know, multiculturalism, defend respect, re defend all of these things um, because they, they can be lost. Yeah, I, I would agree, Marshall. And I, I also think, you know, and it's totally what you're saying as well, but you know, there's so much this idea of American exceptionalism. And I think that generation of the 30s and 40s, I mean, there's a, they're called, I mean, right, the war, the greatest generation. But this was also an aspect of the greatest generation. And um, that's, that's definitely when we use that term, not the kind of things we're thinking about. And I think we need to think about those things. I'll just pop back in here to close us out. Uh, I want to extend on behalf of the museum a big thank you to Daniel Green, Marshall Curry, especially you, Michael Simonson, for all the research you did to, to share some of Florence Menheim's life and legacy with us and Trevor for moderating. Uh, this was fascinating. We will send out tomorrow morning, as soon as it's available, a link to a recording of today's program along with some suggestions for further reading and watching and exploration. And as many of you correctly identified in the chat, there's not a lot out there about Florence Mannheim. So please share this with your friends and family and help tell her story. At, here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, we do our best to live the values of Florence Mannheim's legacy. 
but our work is only possible because of support from audience members like you. So please consider making a donation to support our work at the museum uh, or joining us and or joining us for all of our future programs, as well as the great work of the Leo Beck Institute and our friends across the New York Public Library, Brooklyn Public Library and Queens Public Library. So once again, thank you all and uh, we wish you a great afternoon. Take care.